And it was one of the leading lights of the revolution which came about in atomic physics. Very, very common man. In fact, he was common as an old shoe. You stood in awe of him, and yet you felt relaxed with him. He wanted to do something really exciting and outstanding and out of the ordinary, either buy a car or get a wife. Among his students, three have since received a Nobel Prize. He could often be mistaken for a janitor. One of the major purposes of his life was to make things clear, and he made them clear to himself, and he made them clear to others. At age 45, a distinguished American scientist. At age five, the youngest of three children in the family of a state railway official in Rome. At age nine, a schoolboy with an enormous appetite for books. At age 17, ready to begin an extraordinary career. attended the Scuola Normale in Pisa, a famous school for gifted students. Quantum physics was new then and had not yet reached the classroom. Fermi had to study on his own. To combat the frigid cold of the ancient buildings during the winter, he studied with a crock of burning charcoal on his lap. They still tell a story about him there. One day, the problem in chemistry lab was to analyze a mixture of salts. Fermi thought of a shortcut. He organized his friends and they found a catalog of school supplies and with a microscope from the physics department, they quickly identified the separate ingredients of the mixture by their color, their crystal structure, and so on. Somehow Fermi's whole life work is summarized in this story. His ingenuity, his simplicity, his ability to organize teams, his high spirit, and his habit of getting the right answer by some straightforward shortcut. The time had come to leave Pisa and his friends to study quantum physics at a university where active work in the field was going on. The university at Göttingen in Germany was a center of brilliant activity, and Fermi felt discouraged by the formal and cold atmosphere. He moved on to Leiden in Holland, and there found a warm and enthusiastic teacher, Paul Ehrenfest, who instantly recognized Fermi's potentials and restored his self-confidence. A distinguished physicist himself, Aaron Fest's great ability as a teacher was to prove an example for Fermi. They became good friends. In 1925, Fermi moved to Florence. He became a lecturer at the university where Galileo had worked 300 years before. Here, Fermi followed a pattern which was to be lifelong. Unlike many scientists who specialize in either experiment or theory, he worked with equal zest in both. In 1926, he worked out a new mathematical model for the behavior of gases. His findings, now known as Fermi statistics, brought him international attention and a professorship at the University of Rome. Rome shared some of the mood of the 20s and Fermi enjoyed himself. In play as in work, he was more interested in results than in formal niceties of style. With his primitive dog paddle, he could swim for miles. His knowledge of cars was slight but effective. He was very much aware of girls, one in particular, Laura Capon. Uh, I was a student at the university and he was teaching already. When somehow we started meeting at a certain corner to get on the streetcar, uh, nobody said, let's meet, you see, but we started meeting more and more often. 
I remember trying to teach him to dance. Uh, somehow I always had the poorest dancer in those times, so it didn't matter very much if Enrico didn't feel the rhythm. Fermi had always said that he wanted to do something really exciting and outstanding, either buy a car or get a wife. So when he bought a car, I was a little disappointed, although I really didn't have any ideas of getting married. But then he was more extravagant than he thought himself he could be, and so he got both a car and a wife. I remember a sense of being completely dazed, not even knowing whether he had asked me to marry him or whether he was posing the theoretical question of what would happen if I got married to somebody and he at the same time would get married to somebody else. They married each other in July 1928. An honored guest was Corbino, prominent physicist at the University of Rome. Corbino had decided to bring together a lively group of young scientists with Fermi the cornerstone of a new school of physics. The group became known in time as Corbino's boys. For the next 12 years, they were to join an extraordinary accomplishment, as well as simple camaraderie. They invented elaborate jokes. Fermi, the ever-reliable authority on all matters of physics, was dubbed the Pope. Rossetti was the Cardinal Vicar. And Emilio Segre, who it is said once drove his fist through a desk in a fit of temper, was named after the mythical creature with eyes of fire, the basilisk. And there was the outdoor life, always a passion of Fermi's. He wasn't a particularly good skier, but he was strong and very competitive. And whether it was skiing or hiking or any game or physics itself, he liked to be first. At 27, Fermi was made a member of the Italian Academy. He now had the official title of Excellency but he didn't care much for ceremony or for the robes of office, which had cost him three and a half months' salary. <laughs> In the world of physics, rather than here, he valued recognition. Physics was undergoing a sudden, exciting growth. The basis had been laid by Max Planck, who in 1900 had proposed that the energy of atoms could change only in definite lumps, or quanta. Albert Einstein had extended Planck's ideas and claimed that the energy of light itself exists only in quanta. Ernest Rutherford had found the nucleus of the atom. Niels Bohr had shown how to bring all these findings together to build models of atoms that began to explain their emission of light and their chemical behavior. Now, in the late 1920s, the physicists felt that the remaining puzzles in quantum physics were at last yielding solutions. A series of conferences were organized. Each was a sort of family affair. Everyone knew everyone else. All the important physicists of that period could still have been gathered in one large room or on one small excursion boat. In this atmosphere, the latest theories and experiments and speculations were discussed and debated. Fermi's growing scientific achievements and his gift for simple and clear communication of ideas had already won him a secure place in this lively family of physicists. I first met him in Zurich. It must have been early 1929. Offenheimer was there at the same time. I first met him. There was an international conference which was arranged, a very significant one at that time, and Fermi came, and I first really got to talk to him more or less readily, and, um, and uh, one liked him immediately. And he had just then done a paper in which, in a few pages, had uh, done independently, something which was a very great and large paper by Heisenberg and Pauli. His was simpler and had many people saw it greater elegance, and this was on quantum electrodynamics. In Rome, Fermi and his group worked in the University Physics Building. As always, Fermi combined teaching with his work in both theory and experiment. 
But perhaps his most widely noted contribution in the early 30s was Fermi's theory of beta decay. The puzzle was that in the emission from radioactive materials, most beta rays came out with far less energy than predicted. If the energy is conserved, something must carry the missing energy. Fermi's theory included a suggestion made several years earlier by Pauli that the missing energy was carried off by a chargeless particle, which had not yet been observed. He called this hypothetical particle the neutrino, little neutral one. Fermi's ideas attracted a good deal of interest and visitors of the statue of Niels Bohr began to take note of him. In 1931, Fermi's group helped organize an international physics meeting in Rome. And to it came a group of notable scientists. In this university lab building, Fermi's team had decided that the most interesting new work would be the physics of the nucleus. But their resources were limited. A Geiger counter was a rare instrument then, so they had to learn to build one. They had to borrow a radium source. And so, without frills or fanfare, they began on a road that led directly to the atomic age. Camaldi, Fermi's first student and later his collaborator, recalls... At the beginning of 1934, we received from Paris the information that the Joliot had succeeded very recently to produce a few radioactive bodies, artificial radioactive bodies, by bombarding light elements with alpha particles. And Fermi thought immediately that uh, the neutrons should be a much more efficient agent to produce uh, new radioactive bodies than the alpha particles, since they don't have an electric charge. He started immediately to bombard all light elements with the neutrons produced by this source. We found in particular that if we had irradiated our piece of silver with the source inside or outside a certain lead protection, protection for ourselves, for the radiation emitted from the source, the result was different. We found also that uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, activation of this piece of silver was different according whether the uh, sample was irradiated on a marble table or on a wood table that was nearby. So we were rather puzzled about this uh, result. And our friend Rossetti, he was very critical towards us. He treated us as a young physicist, not very uh, uh, careful in doing measurement. And he started to say, well, you do something wrong. And we were very offended and we protested and said, no, we do our measurement very well. But uh, Rossetti insisted on that. At a certain point, uh, Fermi understood that probably the effect was uh, true, in the sense that the presence of lead or maybe of other material in the vicinity of the source and the detector, detector could change the conditions of activation. How could neutrons produced with the aid of radium sources, such as those contained in the long glass tubes here, produce such puzzling effects? Fermi had guessed that it was due to those neutrons that had been scattered back from the table and from other objects that happened to be on it. These neutrons would be slowed down in the process of scattering, and it was these slow neutrons which could make the silver nucleus radioactive. To test the idea, Fermi let neutrons from the same source go through paraffin before reaching the silver. With a well-shielded Geiger counter, such as this one, Fermi tested whether the radioactivity caused in the silver was much increased. Sure enough, this is what happened. Now, paraffin, of course, contains hydrogen. Why not then try whether water also moderates the neutron's speed? And what better place than the little fountain outside the lab? 
Fermi's prediction proved to be correct. Water also helped the neutrons to activate the silver much more effectively. In high excitement, the group wrote up the results for publication that very night. A whole promising new field of physics had been opened up. Outside the laboratory, however, the world was becoming darker. Under Mussolini, all Italy was being pressed into a political mold which had a new name, fascism. Franco Rossetti tells how it reached into the lab. Uh, Fermi was certainly a, a conservative person. His interest was so concentrated in physics uh, that uh, he had no strong feeling for politics. At that time, of course, uh, in order to uh, have a position in Italian universities, uh, one practically had to be a member of the fascist party. In the United States, starting around the turn of the century, physics had emerged from its adolescence with the achievements of Rowland, Gibbs, Millikan, and of course Michelson, America's first Nobel Prize physicist. At the University of California, Lawrence, along with his student Livingston, built the first cyclotrons. There were also outstanding theoreticians and teachers, and their work was attracting Europeans who came on visits to learn and to teach, among them Enrico Fermi, happy to discover America. The University of Michigan, in the middle 20s, started the Summer Schools for Theoretical Physics. A few prominent physicists were invited, two, maybe three, from abroad or from the United States. The lectures were few, fortunately. There was an enormous amount of time for getting together informally. Fermi was also a marvelous teacher in those days. His lectures were perfect. He made it all simple. He always knew what the essence was. He was never pompous. He never tried to make it more learned than was necessary. Among other visitors to Michigan, Paul Ehrenfest, Fermi's friend and teacher from the days of Leiden. The Europeans greatly enjoyed the holiday atmosphere of the summer school. Even Niels Bohr allowed himself to be jostled into position for a group photograph. After a lecture or a seminar, the work tables became picnic tables and people could eat or watch the flamingos or watch someone imitating the flamingos or the bored lion. But in Europe, a cancer was spreading over mankind. The fascism of Germany, starting from hoodlamism, rose steadily to the murderous persecution of Jews and intellectuals. The luckiest ones escaped to America. 1935, Mussolini and his generals embroiled Italy in a war against Ethiopia. While Italy became absorbed with guns and troops, Fermi's group tried to keep going with its basic research work. They built a high voltage generator for accelerating subatomic particles. As everywhere else, the apparatus of the physics lab was now growing bigger and began to lose some of its homemade look. By late 1938, Italian policy had become almost as fanatically racist as was Germany's. And Laura Fermi was Jewish. There were uh, a, a set of laws were passed in the summer that affected uh, the Jews, but also that affected other people. They would have made the uh, living in that country and raising our children in that country so bad that we decided to emigrate. <laughs> The right occasion suddenly presented itself. In December, Enrico Fermi was called to an impressive ceremony in Stockholm, Sweden. He had won the Nobel Prize in Physics for 1938 for his discovery of new radioactive substances produced by neutron bombardment. The great work he and his group had begun in 1934. Seated next to Fermi, the Nobel Prize winner in literature, Pearl Buck.
As he was receiving his prize from King Gustav, few suspected that Fermi had quietly arranged to begin a new life. He had his family with him, and they would all go on to the United States. Fermi's arrived in New York in January 1939. He would be welcomed by I.I. Robbie and other leading American scientists, Arthur Compton and Harold Urey, Ernest Lawrence and Robert Oppenheimer. The Americans had good young physicists and equipment and above all a happy optimism. Now they were being joined by the best minds of Europe. It was an exciting combination. What I think we had in this country we had produced a large number of people who'd been brought up to a certain level and then needed some help, some leadership to get over the hump. And once they were over the hump, they were tremendous. People of my generation, more or less, that uh, brought, in our respective institution, brought this over the hump. And we brought over the hump largely from attitudes and tastes and developments which we had learned in Europe. Not knowledge so much as attitudes, uh, scientific culture, so to speak. Also early in 1939, Niels Bohr arrived in New York to attend a physics conference in Washington. To his friends, he brought startling news, which literally changed their lives and the course of world history. Bohr had learned that two German scientists had discovered that the nucleus of a uranium atom could be split into two or more fragments, releasing a great amount of energy. Further, the splitting, later called fission, could be provoked by neutrons striking the nucleus. Fermi, then at Columbia, immediately saw the possibility of a chain reaction building up. As he explained it himself in a lecture given later. If there is fission with uh, very serious upset of the nuclear structure is not improbable that some neutrons will be evaporated. And if some neutrons are evaporated, then uh, they might be more than one, let's say for the sake of argument two. And if they are more than one, it may be that uh, the two of them, for example, may each one cause a fission, and uh, from that uh, one sees, of course, the beginning of the, the chain reaction. A fission chain reaction could release enormous amounts of energy. Uncontrolled, it might produce a tremendous explosion. With the clouds of war gathering, the terrible thought arose that the Germans would try to make such a fission bomb. A race with this specter began. A race without parallel in human history. September 1939, and Nazi Germany attacks Poland. The start of World War II. A month earlier, Albert Einstein had met with Leo Szilard, the Hungarian immigrant physicist. Szilard and others drafted a letter to President Roosevelt, which Einstein agreed to sign. The letter informed the president of the work of Szilard and of another immigrant physicist, Enrico Fermi, confirmed the German discovery of uranium fission and cited evidence that the Nazis were beginning research on a nuclear bomb.
Roosevelt recognized this danger and ordered support for research. It seemed clear that the United States had no choice but to enter the dreadful atomic race. The key question to answer first was whether a chain reaction in uranium could really be set up. Fermi and Zillard led the work in self-imposed secrecy. Because slow neutrons were more likely to produce fission, the uranium was to be embedded in a moderating substance that would slow the neutrons. Carbon in the form of graphite, if it were pure enough, was the most promising substance. So a pile of uranium and graphite was built at Columbia University. Fermi explained later how graphite was tested what was happening is that in those days we were trying to learn something about the absorption properties of graphite because perhaps graphite was no good. So we built columns of graphite, maybe four feet on the side or something like that, maybe ten feet high. So physicists uh, on the seventh floor of Pupin laboratory started looking like coal miners. It was the first time when uh, apparatus in physics was so big that you could climb on top of it. In December 1941, it became clear that a chain reaction was likely to occur with a bigger pile and purer graphite. And if that were true, a piece of pure uranium itself might well be made into a weapon. It was decided to expand the research program. Ironically, the very next day, the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor pushed America into the war. All human resources now had to be mobilized, including the scientists. The Pyle project was moved from Columbia University in New York to Chicago. Labs were established at the University of Chicago in a deserted squash court under the grandstand of a football field. An odd location, but it was secure. And now secrecy was more essential than ever. The American physicist Arthur H. Compton was in charge of the whole operation. Fermi was to direct the test of whether a large uranium carbon pile would really sustain a chain reaction. This was no longer basic research, but urgent war work. Fermi was again the same effective leader he had been in his lab in Rome. The young nuclear physicists on his team responded to his zest and warmth. The other, I think the main point of his attraction was the intimate way in which he did uh, physics. Uh, he dealt with it directly and he dealt with it with you. He never left it to you. He always talked about the work as, in a sense, as an adventure on which we were both on and that we would do together uh, jointly. That is, we, we had a those of us who worked with him had a sense of participation in the experiment. There is no film or photograph of the pile they built. Only this painting and a model. Femi later described the pile. It's uh, bricks of graphite piled up in this pile. There is uh, uranium spread throughout the interior. Some neutrons produced in the uranium collide against the graphite, be slowed down to the appropriate energy, react again with uranium, produce more neutrons, and so on and so forth. The final test began. As long as the control rods were in place, they absorbed enough neutrons to keep the pile from self-sustaining reaction. On the morning of December 2nd, 1942, Fermi directed that the control rods be slowly pulled out until only one was left. This was pulled out by hand, step by step. With each step, the meters showed that the activity of the pile increased. Then, on the brink of history, Fermi called a lunch break. After lunch, uh, we resumed, and at 3.25 p.m., uh, I remember the time because I wrote it on the uh, rubber balloon that uh, encased the, the structure. We resumed, and uh, by this time, Fermi was in full control, and he 
knew precisely how far to pull the last rod out. He gave me my instructions, and he announced to the uh, attend uh, those attending that we would now have a chain reaction, and sure enough, we did. Arthur Compton could now make his report. I picked up the phone and called Dr. Cornett at Cambridge. The Italian navigator has just landed in the New World, I told him. The Italian navigator had indeed landed in a new world. A new kind of fire had been ignited that showed the possibility both of peaceful nuclear power and of the nuclear bomb. As it turned out later, the Germans too were constructing a uranium pile. To produce the pure raw materials, uranium-235 and plutonium, a monumental enterprise sprang up across America, the two largest plants being at Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and Hanford, Washington. The basic theory for the weapon was being developed at Los Alamos, some 40 miles from Santa Fe in New Mexico, in what had been a boys' school, now heavily secured. The overall direction of the project rested with the Army, who selected Robert Oppenheimer as chief scientist. The local people in town thought the site might be a concentration camp for enemy aliens. It was true that along with American scientists, Oppenheimer had many foreigners in his camp. Fermi, who came to Los Alamos to help where he could, Edward Teller, a Hungarian, and Emilio Segre, once Fermi's student and his friend and colleague from Rome. Among the many Americans involved were Lawrence and Ravi, who came as consultants. By the summer of 1945, the complicated design problem seemed solved. The raw material was ready, and the Army could make the arrangements to test whether an explosive reaction would occur. A stretch of desert to the south at Alamogorda was chosen as the test site. In the early dawn of July 16th, all was ready. Ironically, the war with Germany had just ended in May. Some of the scientists were hoping that the awesome results predicted on paper would somehow turn out to be forbidden by nature's laws after all. heat of the explosion turned the desert sand to glass. The scientists were awed. The war with Japan was clearly in its final phase, and some of the scientists wrote petitions to the president to use atomic weapons, if at all, on non-civilian targets. President Truman decided otherwise. At his orders in early August 1945, the Air Force dropped two bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Historians are still debating whether the Japanese generals would not have surrendered soon anyway. But the long and terribly costly war was over. Two weeks after the end of the war, a very different explosion occurred. The scientists who had been working for the army rebelled because the army wanted to keep the same security on research as during wartime. Samuel Allison spoke for them. We are determined to return to free research as before the war. If the exchange of scientific information was prohibited by military regulation, research workers in America would leave the field of atomic research and devote themselves to studying the color of butterfly wings. Fairby agreed wholeheartedly, stating publicly that research must be freed from military supervision if nuclear science were to be developed for the benefit of all mankind. As he explained later. Of course, we knew that atomic energy was potentially capable also of peaceful applications. One of them is the possibility of producing large scale amounts of energy with a fuel of very little weight. This feature could make atomic energy useful in some situations in which ordinary fuels might not be practical. Also, the reaction produces as byproducts huge amounts of radioactive substances. They can be used for all sorts of purposes in physics, chemistry, and uh, especially in medicine. 
Steps toward the attainment of these peaceful applications were taken even as Fermi returned to the University of Chicago to begin the last great phase of his career. Looking as ever for interesting problems in new fields, he turned to the physics of subnuclear particles. Enrico had a tremendous interest in any new piece of apparatus, and it didn't matter whether it was a complicated computer or whether it was, I remember an example of a lawnmower. He had never worked a power lawnmower. And I had just gotten this power lawnmower, and he was out at the house, and he saw it, and wanted to see how it worked, and wanted to do it. Whereupon he cut my lawn, which I think was a tremendous honor to have a, your professor cut your lawn. His equipment would essentially disintegrate just when he finished getting all the relevant pertinent data that he needed. He didn't waste his time, which many physicists today do, building very expensive, uh, sophisticated equipment. He just designed his equipment to do the job that was necessary in order to get the results that he was trying to attain. And after that, he didn't have to worry anymore about the equipment. He had a very high sense uh, of economy, economy of time and effort. And he was used to quote uh, a few verses that uh, he thought were due to Michelangelo. Quando hai fatto tanto che ti ba che basta non lo toccare più se no ci guasta. When you have made enough that you believe that is sufficient, don't touch it anymore because you will spoil it. In the summer vacations, he returned to the New Mexico mountains near Los Alamos. Again, he organized hikes and trips with his colleagues and their families, always combining friendship and talk about physics as he had done with his students in Rome a generation before. One of his frequent companions was Norman Nocturne. He rather enjoyed stirring uh, a pot of beans and cooking bacon. Uh, and perhaps he didn't do this at home, that I don't know, but he uh, liked to make breakfast in the morning on these camping trips. Enrico would stop the car and uh, get out his fishing pole, and uh, some of the younger ones of us uh, uh, took our diversion by panning for gold. He didn't catch any fish, and we didn't succeed in getting any gold. It was in the post-war period in Chicago. He founded another school, both in experiment and theory, and some of the most significant younger exponents of physics, both theoretical and experimental, uh, were directly his students. And they remember Fermi, the teacher, with pride and pleasure. Fermi uh, loved to teach. He he seemed to get almost a physical pleasure from it. He loved to teach so much that he almost seemed to delight in people who didn't understand what he was saying the first time. One of the major purposes of his life was to make things clear, and he made them clear to himself, and he made them clear to others. His idea was, well, it helped him understand things in a way to, to explain them. And uh, he always was able to single out those aspects of the problem which are the really essential ones. So that uh, once you grasp those points, you have a superior view of uh, what the whole problem is about. I felt that the circumstances under which I could learn from him were just about ideal. Namely, I worked on a problem for uh, a matter of a few weeks, and then came in contact uh, with Fermi to discuss it, and he would show me how to make progress on a problem on which I had already worked. Each step, as it unfolded to his mind, he would uh, put down, and he would be led along until he came to the conclusion. And when he'd finished, if you took a picture of that blackboard, you would have the, the basis of a well-organized paper for a, a scientific journal. He liked to uh, do a little one-upsmanship and some of this was the uh, was this business of uh, having only one piece of chalk. It's very difficult to argue with somebody who has the only piece of chalk. He would put himself questions, or whenever it was an idle moment, whenever he was strolling along, he is, his mind was working on some feature of the world which he had, which had caught his attention, to see if he could put it into place, he could take it apart, see how it was working. Sometimes he put these questions in a rather surprising way, just to make a kind of joke, a kind of real puzzle. They were not quite puzzles, but they were almost puzzles. He would look at you and say, 
this famous one, which is often told of him. How many piano tuners do you think there are in Chicago? Oh, you feel you have to look that up. But of course, you don't have to look that up. You just have to ask yourself, you can approach a problem many different ways about how many people have pianos, how many houses are there, what fraction, what chances they have a piano, how often does it have to be tuned, how many pianos can a man tune in a day, and pretty soon you have a rough answer. Oh, you won't know exactly, but you'll know it's not thousands or not ones, but somewhere in between. And of course, the better you know the subject, the more you'll be able to answer it. Questions of this sort, Fermi questions. There were other questions for which Fermi felt there were no quick answers. These were political and moral questions that agitated many other scientists. After the war, the scientists who were concerned about the spread of nuclear weapons got together and formed the Federation of American Scientists. A chief aim was to keep the development of atomic energy under civilian control in the U.S. Fermi tried to stay out of such debates, but events soon forced him to take a public stand. In the 1950s, a senator, Joseph McCarthy, became more and more feared for his witch hunts. This distortion of the Senate's powers distressed Fermi, who had a deep-rooted respect for government and institutions. He had a good deal of trust that when the military said they had a requirement, they must know what they were talking about and uh, he had a tendency to, to suppose 